Good morning to you. Um, welcome to City Church. Um, it's lovely to see you. Um, it is good for us um, to gather together. It's good for us to lift our eyes um, to the God of the universe and to worship him. Um, yesterday, uh, I had a fun day. Um, we had a big family gathering, a big family celebration, and we all had a go at curling. Um, it was great. I don't know if you've seen it. The only place I've seen it before is the Olympics. We didn't look like that. Um, but you slide a big stone along the ice um, and uh, try and get it to the target. But while you're doing that, so one person's sliding the stone, and the rest of the team are running along the ice, brushing, brushing it. Um, it, was, it was great fun. But the question is always, how do they stay standing up, running on ice, while they brush it? Um, and the answer is the shoes. They've got these like sticky things on the bottom, and you can run on ice. If the bits come off, you fall over. But if the bits are there, you stay firm and solid. It was great fun, I recommend it, but the closest place is Preston. So, um, but like, as we gather this morning, we're fixing our eyes um, on the one who is firm and solid, um, who is always faithful, who is always reliable, who never changes, um, who never trips us up. Um, and so if you're able, please do stand as we worship our faithful God. Not the 
Okay, take your seats, everyone, and children, would you like to come down to the blue mats in front of me? Okay, so this morning we're going to be continuing to look at the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Now, you may remember that last week we heard about Abraham, and Abraham was given three big promises. Can you show me three as I put them up? The first one was a new land. The second one was a really big family. And the third one was blessings of animals and money and things that Abraham needed. And, well, if we read through the rest of our Bibles, we will see that all three of those things come true. But, you know, it's not always straightforward. You see, it's not always easy for God's people as they trust in the promises that God had given to Abraham. It's a bit like perhaps being on a roller coaster where there's some ups and there's some downs and there's some twists and there's some turns until we get to the finishing line. And they, God's people, had to trust in God. Well, one of those promises, do you remember, was a bigger family and that was exactly what happened. So here's a little mini family tree with Abraham at the top and his son, and his sons, and Jacob had 12 sons. So that was already starting to become a bigger family. 12 sons of Jacob. Well, way, way back, many centuries ago, not long after the Bible began, Jacob lived in the land of Canaan, a fine example of a family man. He had 12 sons. 11 here, and his favorite son, Joseph. And he showed that Joseph was his favorite son by giving him a special coat. You may remember that. By giving Joseph a special coat. Well, that was lovely for Joseph, but what do you think all his brothers felt? They were jealous of Joseph. They were angry. They wanted a special coat too. Why Joseph? Why not them? Well, that didn't make the brothers very happy, but it it kind of got worse because then Joseph started having some dreams. Joseph's first dream was that he was out in the fields gathering in the crops and his great big um, uh, amount of crops was standing tall. But all of his brother's crops were bowing down to Joseph's. Hmm. And then Joseph had a second dream of the sun and the moon and 11 stars. And guess what? Those two were bowing down to Joseph. Hmm. What could those dreams mean? Well, we'll find out later in our story in the next few weeks. But Guess what? Those brothers, they were not happy about hearing those dreams. About 11 people, and there's 11 brothers, 11 sheaves of corn, 11 stars, bowing down to Joseph. They weren't happy with that. And so when Joseph was in the fields one day, looking for his brothers, who were all shepherds, he was looking for them, they saw Joseph coming. And they went and they grabbed him, They grabbed Joseph and they found a great big hole in the ground and they dropped Joseph in. He was trapped. They were going to kill him. But God intervened and one of the brothers said, no, 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 let's not kill our brother, but let's sell him to some traders. So Joseph was carted off to a place called Egypt. So off Joseph went to Egypt. And we'll find out more about what happened to Joseph in Egypt in the next few weeks. 
But Joseph was taken away from his, uh, from his dad and from his brothers. But, well, the brothers needed to explain to his dad why Joseph wasn't there anymore. And so they got a bit of blood from a passing goat. They killed it and they put blood all over the coat, all over that lovely, beautiful coat that had been given to Joseph. And when Jacob, the dad, saw that coat, he burst out in tears. He thought that his son had been killed by a wild animal and he no longer had his favorite son. But Egypt, far, far away, that was where Joseph had been sent. He was still alive, but he was a slave in Egypt. Well, hmm, that doesn't really sound too great, does it? Joseph, all the way in Egypt, how could the hero of the story look like he's been killed, be thrown into that pit, be taken away? How could Joseph, the hero of our story, be treated like that? But, well, maybe you remember over the last few weeks, we've been looking at a different chosen son, the chosen son of God who did nothing wrong, and yet he was lifted up, bruised and beaten, then lifted up onto a cross of wood. And there Jesus died. And blood poured out from his head as a crown of thorns was put on it. And blood poured out of his side as they pierced his side with a spear. Jesus, too, felt the wrath of God, and he was killed. You see, Joseph is a bit of a picture to Jesus. Although Joseph didn't die, Joseph was that chosen son, that special son, who was sent away and was treated badly. But there was a rescue in sight, and we'll find out about that soon. But for us too, there is a rescue for us, because Jesus died on the cross, but three days later he rose again, and if we trust and follow him, we can be his friends forever. So we're going to stand now, and we're going to sing about trusting in the Lord in all times, just like Joseph had to when everything went wrong for him. So let's stand and sing, Trust in the Lord. going to pray for us now. Thank you, God, that you keep your promises. Thank you that even though Joseph's dreams uh, meant his brothers disliked him even more and sold him as a slave into Egypt, God, you were in control. You had a plan for Joseph and you had a plan for us when Jesus came to die on the cross to take away the punishment that our wrong and our sins deserve. Help us to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, kids, we've got our normal group. So for crash age children, so children not yet at school, head upstairs with your parents. Um, if you are a school age child, then reception to year three is the door over there. 
four, five, and six is over there with Angela. If you are new this morning, it's great to have you here. If you could just take your child to the older groups just so we can register them, that would be brilliant. But kids, if you want to stand up and head over to your doors. Thank you. Well, let's pray for our children um, as they go to their groups now. Lord God, we do thank you for the children that we have here at City, for the joy it is to see them each Sunday. Um, we pray that as they go to their groups this morning, they would learn more of you, of your character, of what it means to trust you, um, a faithful God. Pray for the people who are leading the groups this morning, that you'd give them energy, that they would enjoy their time, um, and that you would keep them all safe. Lord, we thank you for the time together. And Lord, for ourselves too, as we come to look at your word, um, that you would help us to learn from it, to be with John as he preaches. We pray that you'd bless our time too. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before um, we hear God's word read and before John comes and preaches for us, um, we're going to sing again a song that's an invitation to come to the God um, who welcomes us who greets us and draws us near and says, welcome. Um, So let's stand together if you're able and sing a song of praise. God's word for us.
Today we will be reading from Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, and it's on page 1200 in the Church Bible. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. May God bless his word to us this morning. And welcome, if you're visiting us, if you're new, you're with us for the first time this morning, we really do want you to have uh, the same welcome that we receive in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in Philemon, it's our second week in Philemon, we started it last week and um, we're going to be looking particularly at Paul's thanksgiving and his prayer to the church. Let's pray as we come, his prayer to God, I should say, for the church, for Philemon too. Let's pray. Father, we, we ask that you would be with us now as we gather around your word. Will you speak to us? Father, we believe that the Bible really is your word to us, that it is God-breathed. And we pray that by your spirit, you would speak afresh what you have spoken into each of our hearts, that we might, as Paul prays, deepen our understanding of all the implications of the gospel through our own lives and our life together. In Jesus' name, amen. What picture might you use to describe the church. What picture might you use to describe the church? There's loads of Bible pictures for the church. Uh, The building is a picture of the church. The body is a picture of the church. Last week we saw from Philemon that the family is a picture of the church. But what other pictures might people use? Well, I guess... If you're looking in from the outside, you might be tempted to think maybe the church is a museum. You know, there's nothing alive, there's nothing relevant here. And of course, some of our church buildings don't help necessarily because they are full of plaques and roped off areas. They kind of look like museums too. For some of us here this morning, we might think, actually, we would love it if the church was a cruise liner. You know, a place where we go for a a nice, relaxing holiday. We gather to make things as comfortable as they can possibly be. Maybe you've heard that expression, church as a cruise liner. Of course, the pushback is that the church shouldn't be a cruise liner, it should be a lifeboat. Maybe you've heard that idea. That feels a lot closer, doesn't it? The idea of church as a lifeboat. The church has this mission that it is on to pluck people from drowning in the open sea to safety. But Jen Oshman, in her book, Welcome, says this. What about the picture of a hospital? Because yes, it's true that we we pray that we might be a means by which people are rescued from danger, but we also really want to care for people on board the boat. She makes the point, actually, that the word hospital is very closely linked to the word hospitality. And hospitality is about welcoming the guest, providing what they need, Lodging, 
for the journey of life. And just as a a hospital, in a sense, welcomes the sick in, so that it might be a kind of a, a place of healing and restoration for them, so in the church, we are called to welcome the other into a place of spiritual restoration. Actually, one historian who was looking into why it is that the church grew so quickly in those early years, he makes this observation. What he found from the data was this, that to cities filled with the impoverished, Christianity offered charity as well as hope. To cities filled with strangers, Christianity offered an immediate basis for attachment. For cities filled with orphans and widows, Christianity offered an expanded sense of family. For cities torn by violent ethnic strife, Christianity offered a new basis for social solidarity. And to cities faced with epidemics and earthquakes, Christianity offered effective nursing services. And the result was a church with the widest welcome. The widest welcome. A church for everyone. Actually, in in Acts chapter 13, we get a tiny little glimpse into one early church in a place called Antioch. And we learn there just, just about the leadership team. We learn that Barnabas was from Cyprus, Simon was a black African. Lucius was from North Africa. Menaean was this man of great privilege. And Saul was this converted Jewish Pharisee. No other room in Antioch would have had that combination. And friends, I want to suggest no no other room in Birmingham has this combination. But where does this kind of welcome come from? How do the barriers come down? Well, this series is called The Widest Welcome. We're looking at Philemon together. And last week, we looked really briefly at the goal of the letter. What was the point that Paul... uh, what What is the reason Paul wrote this letter? And actually, we saw it is almost impossible to imagine how what Paul asks for could come about. You see, he's writing to this guy Philemon, who's a wealthy householder in Colossae, converted under Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Onesimus was one of his slaves, who'd run away and taken money, it seems, as he went. And he heads to Paul, Onesimus, in prison, and he's looking for help. And Paul writes this letter. But in it, what he's going to say, and we'll come to these details next week. But what he's going to say is, look, don't punish Onesimus. Welcome him back as a brother. Secondly, then send him back to me because actually God wants to use his gifts on mission. And thirdly, as you do that, set him free. Set him free from his slavery. Now we're going to return to the detail of the story next week. But that's the destination, basically. That's where we're heading. And if that is where we are heading, it seems like a totally impossible journey. It would be unheard of in the first century at the time of writing. And so we're pausing this morning, as Paul himself does actually in this letter, We're pausing to ask, well, where's the power going to come from for this? What kind of power do we need? What kind of an engine, in a sense, drives the car to that destination? So we're going to lift the bonnet, and we're going to look this morning at the engine of true friendship. The engine of true friendship. And actually, what I want to suggest is that in Paul's little prayer of thanksgiving and praise and prayer, 
right here in verses four to seven, we actually see all the key components uh, that are going to feature again later in the letter. So love is really important here. And that becomes the basis of his appeal in verse 9. Partnership is really important. That becomes the driving force of what he goes on to say in verse 17. Every good thing here becomes a very specific favor that he'll ask for in verse 14. It's almost like Paul has basically opened the medicine cabinet in the hospital. And he is showing Philemon basically exactly what the prescription he needs is for this breakdown of a relationship and what, what's needed to put it right. So let's have a look at these bits of the prescription. The first, you could say it's the whole medicine cabinet, the first one. Because the first thing he wants to remind Philemon of is, is Jesus. Jesus. Look at verses four. Look at verse four, sorry, and five. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Now notice the power for the love of all God's holy people. Notice all of them, all God's holy people. The power comes from Jesus. He says, I hear about your love for all God's holy people and your faith in Jesus. But actually what he's really saying here is, I hear about your love that is flowing from your faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is the energizing heart, the engine for then a community life of love. Well, why is that? Because when we put our faith in Jesus, it changes how we think about ourselves and how we think about other people. And actually the clue, I think, is there in that phrase, all God's holy people. How does he want to describe the church? Holy. Holy. Now that reminds us of who we were, because we weren't always holy. Holiness actually means that all the ugly, evil sin of our lives, all the things that destroy our relationship with God and actually with other people, have been removed so that we can be set apart for the purposes of God. Holiness isn't something we can achieve. It's ours as a gift. It's a status here from God through faith in Jesus. Jesus is the the sin killer and the holiness maker. And the cross of Jesus is the place where, in a sense, the friendship destroyer (laughs) is itself destroyed. And actually, when we we stand before, when we kneel before the cross, humble ourselves before the cross, it helps us to own our own sin. It brings us down a peg or two, but it also helps us to treat other people with grace. It lifts them up. Think back to, we did a whole series thinking about what it means to live forgiven. What we saw over and over again is that the power for reconciliation comes when we become friends with God. That's where the power comes from. So it reminds us of who we were, this idea of holiness, but it also reminds us of who we now are. See, Paul doesn't address them. In fact, he never addresses them as kind of, you know, you horrible lot or something like that. You know, oh, you, you, you bunch of no-hopers. That's never how he would speak of the church. 
He reminds them of their status. Holy. Holy. And actually that suddenly makes the impossible possible. Because God lives in us. It also means we should never write anyone off but instead see them as God sees them now. And so often when I think about my own life, I am incredibly gracious with myself and judgmental towards others. So, you know, if I'm late, well, it's because my alarm didn't go off. It's because nobody reminded me about the road works. It's not my fault. If you're late, well, it's because you're lazy and thoughtless, and this is your last chance. <laughs> but we can do that in all sorts of areas of life, can't we? As we look into the lives of others and look at ourselves. But in Jesus, we are God's holy people which actually means both that we are more wicked than we could possibly imagine, but also more loved than we could ever dream. And that is true for everyone in Jesus. And suddenly we all have an awful lot more in common with each other than we thought. So there you go. There's the, in a sense, as Paul opens the medicine cabinet, the first thing we see is Jesus. Secondly, partnership. Partnership. So we're just going to focus on this key word in verse 6, and then we're going to look at the prayer itself, okay? But look, there it is in verse 6. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing that we share for the sake of Christ. Now, the word partnership is the word koinonia, okay? Why don't we just say koinonia together? Ready? Koinonia. You are Greek speakers. Did you know that? Some of you may already be Greek speakers, but there we go. And it's possible if you are a Greek speaker that I have pronounced it wrong, but there we are. (laughs) But koinonia basically means something like participation, sharing, fellowship, communion, friendship. And for us, when we use the the language of partner, it it can sometimes feel a little bit shallow, like Woody from Toy Story. Howdy, partner. Have a rootin' tootin' day. I'm not going to do the accent. But actually, I want you to think of partnership as this incredibly deep and rich thing. Actually, the, the closest I could think of was really the idea of the partnership of marriage, a bond so deep, so rich, that two people are now described as one flesh. That is what he's getting at here. And what he's saying is that they have this partnership, your partnership with us in the faith. Now, he's not just saying, isn't it lovely that we all believe the same thing? Great. What he's saying is, we have a partnership that comes with our faith. Or even, there is this spiritual reality, which means we are one, in partnership with one another, because of our faith in Jesus. Which means you can't have faith in Jesus without already, without then immediately, you should say, discovering that you're in partnership with others. Whether you like it or not, I should say. So let me put it this way. Imagine you want to fly in an aeroplane to Brazil. Any Brazilian people here this morning? It's a wave. There they are. There's the Brazilian contingent. We love you. We're so glad you're here. I've never been to Brazil, which is why I want to think about Brazil. Okay, you're on this plane. You want to go to Brazil. Now, when you get to the airport, 
you do not just sprint down the runway or follow in the general direction of the plane. You don't watch the plane take off in the hope that it will somehow inspire you in your own flight. That is not how it works. You need only one relationship with that plane. You need to be in it. And if you are in it, then what happens to the plane happens to you. And friends, that is just the way it is with our faith in Jesus. We need only one relationship with Jesus. We need to be in him. And then whatever happens to Jesus happens to us. And by the way, the New Testament says he is already seated in the heavenly realms. But what it also means is because we are in Jesus, because I am in Jesus, because you are in Jesus, because they are in Jesus, we are all in the same plane together. We're all going to Brazil. And whether we realized it or not, whether we like it or not, we are both in Jesus and therefore in partnership with each other. The two are inseparable. And this whole new reality is exactly the thing Paul is going to make a massive deal out of when it comes to this very thorny issue of Philemon's particular situation. Just look forward to verse 17. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Now, Paul is emphasizing this is something that has already happened, not something we have to somehow make happen, something they have to create for themselves, but his third ingredient from the medicine cabinet is really about energizing this truth into action. And the third thing is this, prayer. Jesus, partnership, prayer. So verse six again, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Now, it's not very easy necessarily to see quite what he's praying at this point, but it's something like this. Lord, will you please ensure that this partnership that we have through faith in Jesus might, be, might come alive, might be energized with the powerful effect of us then really understanding all of the good and loving things that we're called to do for one another as those who belong to Jesus. It's that kind of a thing. What he's saying is, look, partnership isn't just a static thing. It's an energizing principle that will produce the full reality that it's pointing to. Another way of putting it would simply be to say this. Lord, help us become what we are. Help us really become what you've made us to be. We're on this plane together, Jesus. (laughs) You know it. We are journeying partners together, Jesus. Help us live like it. That's the prayer. And that phrase, every good thing we share, it's quite intriguing, isn't it? It's quite vague, in fact. You know, it isn't a list that we can just legalistically follow. It isn't just a list we can tick off and complete and say, good, I've done my bit. It is actually, in in a sense, a limitless adventure of growing in what it means to live a life worthy of Christ. But behind it, this idea of every good thing, in a sense, what we're going to see is that Paul has one very particular good thing in mind. 
for Philemon. And it's to do with Onesimus. And actually, if Philemon is open to every good thing, well, then he really needs to be open to this. But I want to ask at this point, look, is this our starting point? Is it your starting point? You know, you look around you, maybe you think of a particular difficult friendship in church, with a Christian beyond this church, wherever. Is your starting point, well, Jesus, you've made us partners, so will you help me in this? Is that your starting point? I'm not sure it's my starting point always. I think it's more, for me, something like this. Lord, how could you do this? We are from different planets. Rescue me, deliver me. Lord, let me give you all of the reasons this is always going to be impossible. Do you agree? But be encouraged, be encouraged. Because with prayer, Paul is saying, our understanding can deepen. And deepening understanding for Paul is not about growing a big brain. It's about growing a big heart. It's about knowledge that really means we begin to learn how to love other people in actually what may be increasingly complex situations. And we all need to deepen our understanding. You know, if you come to faith, say, in a Christian home, your understanding is going to need to deepen as you leave home, as you stand on your own two feet, as you navigate a new context. You know, living as a Christian at university is not necessarily going to prepare you for life as a Christian in the office or in the factory. Deeper understanding is going to be needed when you face retirement or old age or some other circumstance in your life that is beyond your control. The culture around us is always changing. And you might face ethical dilemmas you've never encountered before. You may face people you've never met before from very different backgrounds to you, backgrounds you don't understand, who approach life in seemingly incomprehensible ways to you, who've had experiences that you've never had. We all need to deepen our understanding. In those moments, what do we do? What do we do? We pray, Lord, help me go deeper. So Jesus, partnership, prayer, finally, doesn't end with prayer. It ends with action. And of course, actually, action is exactly where this letter is heading. But do you notice every good thing actually then flows straight into the example of Philemon's own life. He's he's good, Paul. He's he's really actually genuinely honoring Philemon, even as he then goes on to challenge him. But look at verse 7. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you Brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. In fact, brother comes at the end of that sentence. He's saying, because you have refreshed the the hearts of the Lord's people, brother. In so many ways, Philemon is the model 
actually, of love without discrimination, love without favoritism. It's just he's got a massive blind spot, which we'll come to next week. But you see, action is important because the outworking of partnership is not just a passive thing. We don't just pray and then fold our arms, sit back and wait for the return of Jesus. We don't just pray and fold our arms and wait for everyone else to sort of somehow become a little bit more like us. Now, right now, there are good things, simple steps that he is calling each of us to in this area. And Philemon's ministry has been one in which he has refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Now, refreshing hearts might sound a little bit lame to us. I don't know. But actually, the, the, the refreshment idea is a military idea. It's basically, this is how you recover when you've kind of marched all day. You're absolutely exhausted. What you need is refreshment. And basically Philemon was that kind of guy. He was the refresher of hearts. What an amazing ministry. What an amazing ministry. Now I don't know if this happens in every culture, but I I was in the primary school football team. When I was at primary school, I should add. (laughs) Now, I, I had a very, very subtle gameplay as a footballer. I wasn't really a striker. I wasn't really a defender. I sort of ran around, sort of monitoring the situation, slightly panicked, slightly directionless. So they put me in midfield. And actually, looking back, I don't think we were a very good team. I have one memory, actually, of a game in which they stopped the game early because we were losing 13 <laughs> nil. But the thing that was the sort of big memory for me was the great thing about these matches was half-time. This kind of gives away my sporting prowess, doesn't it, at this point? But what, one of the mums would appear... With, with a huge bucket of orange slices. Half-time oranges. And basically, this was the moment of refreshment. This was where all the wounded and all the kind of weary could limp onto the sideline and get their refreshing half-time oranges. And I, I think, you know, there's a sense in which Philemon was the halftime oranges of the church. That's who he was. But what a gift for a church facing tough times to have people whose ministry is halftime oranges. Well, I wonder what people would say about you. I wonder what people would say about me. Are you more half-time oranges or red card or, I don't know, nuclear warhead? But do you see the, the engine here for friendship? It is Jesus, partnership, prayer, and action. And Philemon basically is showing us that this is the kind of foundation that will turn our churches into hospitals for anyone and everyone. Ray Ortland, who is the pastor of a church in the States, he begins every service with these words, to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus himself, the friend of 
sin is. So that's the welcome, friends, that the gospel calls us to. And it's the widest welcome of all. I was reminded of um, one of the first things that we did in the church that I belonged to for 10 years before coming to City. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what to do, in fact, really. But the church had really sought to be very welcoming over the years. But there was a sense in which the language of the the surrounding community and the language of the church were just completely different to one another. The, the community had moved on many, many years before. And actually the church had kind of got stuck. And without realizing it, what it meant was that the church was communicating the opposite, actually, to what it wanted to. That really this is not a church for you. As I said last week, this is a church for judges or whatever. And there was this old wooden notice board that was kind of stood at the front, slightly lopsided. And we didn't really know what to do. Just something, something to change the narrative. And so we just stuck up this big poster, and it said, you are welcome. And I remember someone saying, but what if people actually come? (laughs) I was thinking, I know. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But actually, you know, what what they really meant was, what if the wrong people read it and they think they're welcome? And friends, I think we can all operate with a kind of similar fear in the background. What if the wrong people think they're welcome? You know, what will we do then? What if they're not very city church? Well, friends, we can cross that bridge when we come to it. But I can guarantee that part of the answer, the foundation to this is Jesus, partnership, prayer, and action. And as we kind of finish, I just want us to see the warning here because Philemon has a massive blind spot. And that's the thing about blind spots, isn't it? You can't see them. And we're going to see his blind spot next week. And we'll read it and go, how can you not see this? And Paul is going to challenge him big time and the rubber is really going to have to hit the road for him in all of the good things that partnership should bring. But friends, we have our blind spots too. Let me just give you one terrible trend that we very easily buy into, okay? It's something like this, okay? There is a theory, in fact, it's true, that if you get a group of people who are all very similar to each other, then they will very quickly attract more people who are similar to them. So if your goal is to grow quickly, that's the model to follow. Get really like-minded people who are all basically the same, and you'll grow. Let me give you its posh title, The Homogenous Unit Principle. See, it's a thing. You hear it a lot. You hear it in church planting. If you want to start a new church, then create a little homogenous unit, a widget of like-minded people. And that little widget will grow and it will multiply and then there'll be lovely little widgets all over the world. Student churches can reach students. Middle-class churches can meet middle-class people. This kind of church can meet those people. And of course, if one widget can't adapt, or one widget just can't change, or is really struggling to accommodate others, it's fine. Just create a new widget. But friends, what does that do to the widest welcome? Most importantly, what does it do to the gospel? 
Paul says the starting point for a gospel-saturated culture in the church is not growth and multiplication at all costs. It is our partnership together in the gospel and in the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, we can all operate with a kind of little mini version of the homogenous unit principle where we are constantly, basically, just trying to look out for the people in the room who are most like us. And our goal might not be numerical growth, it might just be a comfortable life, a stress-free existence. But actually, Philemon is challenging us. He's saying, look, our goal needs to be God's goal. Which is a greater and richer expression of loving partnership by growing a deepening understanding of what it means to do good and love one another. And actually, that is the engine that will propel us to cross the room. To move towards people who are different to us and not away from them. Here's your application. Speak to someone different at the end of the service. Invest in new connections and not just fall back to the old ones. Maybe you need to reach out and say sorry to someone. Maybe you need to drop that mental list of what we need from someone if we're ever going to love them. It's scary, isn't it, in a way? Paul says, it's all right. We can cross these bridges as we come to them. With Jesus, partnership, prayer, and action. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we look to you as the one who has reconciled us with the Father. We bring you praise and glory and honor. We want to bring glory to you, Father, to you, the Son, and to you, the Holy Spirit. And may our life together glorify you, our great God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And may our life together glorify you in the way we love each other. And may that be a sign to the watching world of a of another, a power from another world, a power from, a, from another reality, a supernatural power, and point people to you. We need your help. And I just want to say thank you that we have it. Deepen our understanding, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing again um, a song of commitment as we think about what it means that the Lord Jesus has died for us um, and has welcomed us. What does it mean for our lives? So again, if you're able, please stand and we'll sing together.
down and let's pray together. Lord God, thank you that we can come to you because you welcome us. You offer the widest possible welcome and that you have shed, Jesus has shed his blood so that we can come to you. We thank you for that privilege. We thank you for our partnership in the faith with Rachel Smith, our mission partner working as a midwife in South Asia. We thank you for her example to us as she's made choices that are countercultural, that she serves you in a place that can be difficult and make sacrifices that impact her comfort and relationships. Would she know that you are the God who sees and knows? Would she be reassured of your love and care for her and be encouraged as she sees some of the work you're doing through her? As she juggles different teaching and training and admin and clinical work, give her the energy, rest and wisdom she needs. Lord, we lift you our broken world. We pray for those whose lives have been devastated by events that we've heard about in our news this week. For those affected by floods and knife crime, by famine, by war. In each of those situations, we pray for the weak and vulnerable, that they would get the help that they need. We pray for the grieving, that in their sorrow, they would look to you. And we pray that you would raise up leaders who love peace and justice, will speak up for what's right, even when it's costly for them. We pray for the country of Sudan. We pray that the authorities would be willing to hold talks rather than fight that they would protect civilians. We pray particularly for Christians in that country. Please keep them safe as they gather together to worship you. Help them to be voices of peace and hope in their communities. We pray that they would continue to know some religious freedom there. Closer to home, we pray for those in our church family who are suffering personal heartache. Would you comfort and strengthen them? Put people around them who offer hope and comfort. We pray for those who are celebrating too. We give you praise for six new babies that have been born since the beginning of the year and lift those new families to you. But we pray for those who feel the pain of childlessness or miscarriage or baby loss. Help us to love one another well as a church family as we come together bringing our joy or our grief, our fears and our hopes. Help us to cross the room. Help us to listen well to one another to forgive one another, to grieve together and to celebrate with one another. Lord, we want to pray too for Patrick and Lauren as they get married next Saturday. We pray that you would give them great joy in that day and their wedding um, would be one that um, makes you the centre where your name is lifted high. And as they adjust to married life together, we pray for your blessing. Lord, we do pray for us that you would deepen our understanding of every good thing we share in Christ. Lord, we pray that the things that we've heard this morning would change our lives. Help us to deepen in our knowledge of you because we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, there's a few things um, to let you know about coming up in the life of the church. Um, So I think Debs and Vicky have got something important to share with us. You'll be at this sort of thing, Vicky. Yeah. Um, So I I was reading the other day um, about a group of people in in, in Kyrgyzstan who've never heard about Jesus. Do you know where that is? Um, Debs, there's a problem. You've got the map upside down. That would probably help start off with. It's kind of over there. That's Kazakhstan. Oh, thanks, Vicky. Vicky, you know what? I was reading, there are so many people groups and communities across all the countries in the world where people have never heard about Jesus. Isn't that awful? It is. And did you know there's even people here in the UK who have heard about Jesus as well? Oh, Vicky. I wish there was some way that we could find out more about how we can be sharing the gospel across the world to people who've never heard about Jesus. Well, you're in luck. In just over, just under a month, we're going to be having a missions conference here. Have you heard about it? That sounds great. 
It is. It's exciting. Let me tell you about what's going to happen. So we're going to spend the weekend together. Everybody from the church is invited. On Friday evening, we'll be gathering um, at the church office. I think it's 6.30 till 8. Fantastic. <laughs> and on Saturday, there'll be an opportunity in the kind of late afternoon, evening, 4 till 9. And even on Sunday, there'll be stuff as well. It's really exciting. That sounds wonderful, Vicky. How can I sign up? Well, you can sign up and find out more details on Church Suite. If you haven't got Church Suite, Harry, I'm sure, would love to tell you more about it. And there's the e-news, there's information there as well. You can come and talk to us. And the really exciting thing is it won't just be us talking and, and people from the UK, but we're going to be having guests from the Middle East coming and sharing their experiences, what they've been up to, sharing the good news of Jesus with the people in the countries they're in. Wow, I'm going to sign up today. And I hope everyone else will too, because otherwise they're really going to miss out. Absolutely, sign up. I'm going to sign up too. So yeah. <laughs> Um, there's something else um, that you could sign up for if you're a woman. So in two, um, two weeks' time, not next Saturday, the Saturday afterwards, we have our next uh, women's breakfast, um, looking, at the book, um, looking at Psalms. It's a great opportunity to get together, to get to, to deepen relationships, actually, um, to have good breakfast um, and to, to learn more from the Psalms as well. So that's happening. Um, Breakfast is free, but if you'd like to pay, there's an opportunity to do that too. Um, and you can sign up again, Church Suite, or on our church website. Um, you can sign up, it helps us for, with catering. Um, if you're new, a uh, particular welcome to you. We'd love to um, connect with you more to get to know you better. Um, if you're able to give us an email address or some sort of contact, there's an iPad in the foyer. Um, and that way we can get, you, get in touch with you, let you know the things that are going on. Um, after the service, there is tea and coffee um, served through those double doors. That is your opportunity. Normally, you have to wait a few hours um, before you can put into practice the stuff you've learned in the sermon. Now is your chance. Um, so you can go and grab a tea or coffee and go and say hello to somebody that you've not spoken to before, that you don't know. And let's be gracious with one another. You know, let's forgive the people who we've spoken to a lot and who come up and say, is this your first time here? Or who you've forgotten their name? Let's be kind. Let's take those risks and say hello to people whose names we've forgotten or who we haven't seen for a while. Um, let's do that. Um, but as we close, we're going to um, sing one final song. Living Waters is the song that we're going to sing. So let's, let's stand and sing together. <laughs>
pray as we close. Lord God, thank you for the privilege of being together this morning, um, for your words, for your challenge to us. We pray that the things that we've heard really would change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, tea and coffee and conversation is that way. <laughs> <laughs>